Sloan School of Management at MIT. And on my left is Sherwood Denise, uh, who's with Crowdfund Capital Advisors, uh, one of the leading pioneers, actually, in the whole area of crowdfunding, which we'll find out more about. Uh, to his left is uh, Mustafa um, Abdel Wadud from the Abraj Group, which is the leading private equity late stage uh, investors here in the region. Um, to his left is Walt Mayo from Endeavor, um, again, a leading group that advises entrepreneurs all over the world on how to be successful and to scale. And then to the extreme left is um, Ahmed El Alfi, uh, uh, the CEO of Sawari Ventures, which is an early stage venture capital group. So you've got a, uh, an interesting group over here, right? You've got everyone from um, you know, folks who advise entrepreneurs to early stage venture, to late stage private equity, um, to somebody who can come in and get rid of the, all those financiers and just do it in a crowdfunding model, right? If you don't like any of those. So we'll get an interesting perspective uh, today on you know, everything around, uh, around uh, um, uh, financing. So just to start off with, I think um, I was talking to the panelists before this, and uh, I guess the, the, the advice I got was to keep it real. So we're going to try and keep it as real as we can. And the first thing we'll start with is to ask, especially the, uh, uh, the folks in, the, in, in this group who've actually done um, uh, investing before, what they like about pitches they've heard and what they don't like about them, right? I mean, because I assume whether you're going to be invest pitching to friends and family or to angel investors or to banks or to VCs or to private equity, you're going to have to pitch your company, your idea. So let's hear from these guys to see uh, some real do's and do's, uh, don'ts around it. So whoever wants to start. Okay, so the first question is, um, how many of you out there are entrepreneurs? Raise your hand. That's really, really encouraging because uh, Alfie and I were on a, a panel about three weeks ago at Harvard Business School, and I started to get worried that I'm, I'm basically now on some kind of circuit where I get to travel around the world with Alfie every so often, and we get to hear each other talk. So, um, so for the entrepreneurs out there, just very briefly, Endeavor is an organization that identifies the highest impact entrepreneurs in countries around the world. And by high impact, we, we mean entrepreneurs that have the potential to get very big. 50 million, 100 million, 500 million. The largest company in our portfolio is about $4 billion. So we're talking about the, the ones that have the real breakthrough potential. But the bottom line is for anybody, you have to be able to articulate what your business is about. And you have to be able to do it in a way that people understand. So whether you're talking about a really formal venture capital presentation, or you're just talking about trying to raise money with a bank loan, or you're talking to a high net worth individual, you have to give them a sense of what your business is about. Now the single biggest problem that we see in the pitches is their inside out pitches. And by that we mean the entrepreneurs are describing what they're doing because that's where they spent all their time and energy. So they're typically focused on their product. And, and I call that the frozen yogurt problem, okay? And the frozen yogurt problem is this. You go to somebody and, you, and, and, and you've got this wonderful business idea and they say, well, what is it? And you say, well, I've developed this machinery and what I can do is I can take traditional yogurt and through a variety of processes, I can make it frozen. And so you can serve it, and it's kind of like ice cream. That's kind of interesting, but it's not really clear what problem you're solving. Now, if you flip it around and you say, here's the problem. Everybody loves ice cream, but nobody wants to eat it anymore because they're worried about it being fattening. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a product that tricks them by an effect giving them something that's as good as ice cream, but it's really frozen yogurt. So what you're defining is the problem, not your product. And it's essentially three things you need to do. One, why are you the right people? Two, what problem are you solving? And three, is it a big enough problem to be interesting? And if you can essentially boil it down to those three things, why I'm the right person to address this, something about your skills or experience or passion, the problem that you're solving, because everyone intuitively gets that, and then why it's big enough to merit your time and attention, 
then I think you've got a long way toward getting people interested enough to hear the rest, like show me your business plan, et cetera, et cetera. So the frozen yogurt problem. Great. Um, so Ahmed, um, uh, you obviously hear a lot of early stage uh, uh, pitches in Egypt. Is there anything specific that if you hear, you're like, okay, I'm going to invest in that company? Is there any specific thing that you can point to? I'm not sure, but I can tell you for sure there's a lot of specific things I hear that I say I'm not going to invest in that company. Right. Well, why don't you okay. tell that then? So a lot of negative filters. Uh, anybody who puts an IRR calculation into an early stage presentation, I just show them the door in about three seconds. All right? If I need a calculator for an early stage investment, I'm not going to look at it. So if it takes a lot of math to figure out whether your early stage startup is worth looking at, you probably shouldn't be doing it. It has to make so much sense and be so compelling that it's worth chasing. That's how I look at early stage. And for you guys, for people coming to me for money, you're like, you're fishing, okay? Your job is to put something like a little glittering thing in front of me to attract my attention. Don't overwhelm me with, you know, a, a, a tremendous amount of data. The idea is catch the person's attention. Uh, Walt summed it up. I, I kind of simplify it even more is, you know, what, why, how, and who. That's it. Really pretty, four really simple concepts. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? And who are you? Okay, why should it be you? And that's it. And if you can keep that simple enough and attract somebody's attention after that part, then they should look at the company. Then I want to see the business model. Then I want to dig in and look at the resumes. Then I want to do my due diligence and hire an expert on this technical part of what I want to look at. Then we're going to dive in and look at the specifics of the company. Uh, and a lot of plans at the early stage, we have funded many companies on one piece of paper. Okay? Just a single piece of paper. So, uh, and one meeting. But those are early stage companies, we'll house them, we'll incubate them, we'll give them seed funding to start them, and then we'll do the next round depending on how they perform. And it's like staged investments. So, don't know that I can tell you what, but I can definitely tell you what not. Fair enough. Uh, Mustafa, what do you guys look for in uh, late stage? Sure. Um, any pitches that particularly strike you, it's particularly attractive or not? So, so, so we do a wide range, starting from uh, growth capital all the way to large-scale buyouts. But I think for us, I guess the, it's a little bit of a different angle because at, at that point in time, it's a proven business. Uh, obviously, there's, there's a revenue model that works, and, and at that stage, usually in most cases, these are profitable businesses. So what we, the role we play is a little bit different. We come at a later stage, and we help scale up these businesses. We look at businesses. So the, the bit around whether it works or not, we already know that, but we are assessing businesses that can be taken to the next level. So. Uh, there, there's a little bit of history to go by when you look at these businesses. It's been operating and sometimes you look at the ability of that business to uh, to sort of deep bottleneck and scale up and that requires management bandwidth because often the entrepreneurs behind it need to recognize that they can take it to a certain level but they will need to deepen the bench of, of uh, management team behind them to take it to the next level. It will require capital but I think that's, that's not the, the core issue. I think it requires also the presence of a supportive uh, partner, a supportive financial partner. So we spend a lot of time making sure that we feel that we're, first of all, that we believe in the business model, but we spend a lot of time making sure that we believe in the team that can execute, including jointly agreeing on where the gaps are and how we can take those businesses uh, to, to the next level. So for us, it's a little bit more scientific. I can't do it on a hunch, but at the same time, we need to maintain the entrepreneurial thinking. We need to believe that, so, so I need to balance a little bit of the hunch with uh, the, the existing capability of these businesses and their ability to, to take it forward from there. Great. Anything you want to add to Sherwood? Well, uh, you know, I'm here to talk about crowdfunding, so I would, I would venture to say that these guys represent the status quo, and uh, what I represent and talk about is, is the future. And I think what you guys are talking about here is something critically important that all businesses need to have, which is a solid business plan, a solid foundation, a solid team. But the fact of the matter is you left out the most important part, which is what we represent today, which is the crowd. The fact of the matter is, is people can walk into your offices with brilliant ideas, but you want to know whether or not they think there's people that are going to buy it. 
And what crowdfunding does, it allows people to go out to the community now and pitch their ideas to the community and get the traction from the community. And unless they get buy-in from the community, they don't actually fund that business. So what we're going to do in crowdfunding is actually bring you better deal flow and de-risk the investment for you. So what I would encourage you in when you're looking at your business models is go out there and make sure that it's not just a solid business model that can and generate cash, but it's something that has the, the crowd behind it and people that will actually go out and buy that product or service. Great. So uh, just uh, another question. Yes. Sure. So I think you've officially lost control of the panel. Total elapsed time, four and a half minutes. That's no, fine. no, uh, just, I just want to correct one thing. Crowdfunding is not the future. Crowdfunding is it's something, it's a natural progression of technology and normal human behavior. And it's a complement to what we do, definitely not a replacement. I don't see crowdfunding as a threat. I see it as something, I see crowdfunding as a tool to supplement what we're doing and what we're proposing with investors. And as I mentioned to you earlier, we, f we funded a crowdfunding vehicle in MENA for that purpose because we think it's complementary. Can I just add to that? Because it does play a very interesting role at, at, a, at an early stage, but I think we cannot lose sight of the fact that what a lot of businesses need is not just capital, but actually the guidance, the support, the network, actually, the relationships, and the ability to help this business go forward. You talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, they're trying to break down walls, they're trying to enter right. into new markets, they're trying to uh, find different ways to do things. And I think, to Alfie's point, it is extremely complimentary. Right. So uh, let, me, let, me, let me just um, jump on that, please. So, I'm um, sorry, no, I, I, I do need to ask you guys that, right? So you just mentioned something very important, which is, um, you know, I've been in the, uh, in the entrepreneurship business for 20 years, and I've raised, you know, about over $100 million for several of my businesses. And many of the top venture capitalists, private equity firms in the US and abroad have said exactly that, right? We're not just a source of capital, we provide guidance, we provide um, mentorship, we allow you to scale, right? In my experience, and in the experience of many of my fellow entrepreneurs at Sloan and at other places, I have yet to see a single venture capital add any value other than capital, right? Everyone says that, they don't add a single dime of, 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 uh, of uh, value. So what do you guys do Can specifically that is actually adding value beyond you, adding value? You probably value? overlooked one thing. To ask you the question, yeah, but I have Absolutely, to. you probably overlooked one thing when they gave you that capital. They made sure you reported and complied. The discipline, so the single most important thing you can do as a provider of capital before all the other value add is instill a sense of corporate governance. It serves you, it serves us, because we have a more reliable counterparty on the other side that we get the right level of information, the right level of documentation. It serves you as a business because it puts you through the process of having to think about your business plan. So you're saying budget. the fact that I spend 70% of my time as a CEO writing reports for, for the VCs on the board is actually adding value to my business? You saw the wrong side of it. You should see them as reports that serve you. And if they don't serve you, you should have the discussion around that. Because if they don't serve you, they don't serve the business. Ultimately, that's what you look for in a partner. And maybe your experience has been a little bit different. And I'm not going to say it's all rosy. But at the end of the day, that discipline, because you know, ideas are a dime a dozen. And the role we come in and do is the ability to execute and scale up. I see lots of people with brilliant ideas that never translate into successful businesses because they've got the entrepreneurial flair. They don't have the management discipline. So as much as we love to glamorize entrepreneurship, it's extremely important to put behind it the management and the execution skills to take it to the next level. And I think just on a base level, governance is a big step towards that, and the rest is a bonus. I, I would tell you, walk over to the flat six booth, okay, and ask any of my entrepreneurs, and go through that exact same sequence with them. And if we don't add value, we really are nothing more than a commercial bank, and we wouldn't have people leaving their homes in Yemen to relocate to Cairo to be near us, okay? The, he's actually, he's over there, one of the guys, he gave me probably the greatest compliment I've ever had, is that if you hadn't set this up and done it this way, I would have never left my 15 year job at IBM to start the company I always wanted to start. Okay, so th okay. there's two sides to that coin. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, uh, no, go ahead, Woody. Uh, just the only other thing, I wanted to agree with Alfie. 
the, the, the importance of what we're doing in crowdfunding itself is very old tradition, it's not new. What this is, it ushers in Web 3.0, which is where we merge Web 2.0, which is social media, with community financing. But uh, to your point too, I think the beauty about what we're seeing in crowdfunding, it's, it's about the crowd, and so we're crowdsourcing not only money, but knowledge and wisdom from people that can actually support an entrepreneur. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're going forward with these ideas. Well, I mean, if, so, if do you, do, so just following up on that, uh, Sherwood, do you think crowdsourcing of funding, right, or crowdfunding is going to disintermediate the traditional investors the way so many other um, internet techniques and, you know, crowdsourced things have disintermediated uh, traditional sources of, you know, advice, capital, things like that? I, I think this fills a void. I think there's a funding void that exists out there for companies that are looking for startup and, and growth capital, probably zero to $250,000, and this helps step in where that capital doesn't exist. I think what we will do when we can actually find the companies that the crowd supports is we provide an on-ramp to you guys and provide you with de-risked investments so that you can make smarter investment decisions knowing that there's a community of people that want it. So I think it goes hand in hand. I don't think it, it, it replaces anything. I think it's disruptive in the sense that we've gotten so used to not allowing people to invest in this way that now we're coming out with a mechanism that standardizes the process to allow it to happen. Okay. Great. And, and just a regional comment. What Woody does really is the manifestation of Islamic finance. Okay, he doesn't really realize it, but he's pure Islamic finance, which is everybody put in their equity capital and participate as an equity shareholder and not be a lender to companies. So, you know, on behalf of the Muslim community, I want to thank you on that. Very, very <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Great. Well, we're going to open it up for questions from, from all of you guys, because I'm sure you have a lot of questions as well. Just going to ask a couple of other questions uh, on, on a, a few uh, related topics. Uh, so one other thing was, again, something that you just partially mentioned, right, that which is an on-ramp to traditional investment, whether it's early stage VC or late stage private equity. So what are some of the other on-ramps available or alternatives available to traditional equity investing here in the, in the MENA region, for example, right? I mean, so in the US, for example, you have um, things like the Small Business Association, which provides guarantees to small businesses that allow them to get loans from commercial banks because otherwise they wouldn't because they don't have, have a history, for example. So I was able to do that with one of my startups, got a half million dollars because I got a uh, SBA guarantee, right? So are there sources of alternative funding and agencies like that available in emerging markets, whether it's Egypt, whether it's you know this region, for example? Uh, I can't comment on agencies, but I want to ask, can I have a show of hands of how many people here run companies, operating businesses, or work for government institutions? Okay, so you guys are the other best funding alternative in the region here. Give these small companies business. Give them revenue. Don't put all your RFPs out to multinational corporations. Okay, that's your homework assignment to help promote the ecosystem in the Middle East. All right, is give every small business the same chance you'd give a Vodafone or a big multinational. All right, they will perform for you. Give them a shot. They're really good, and I, I've gotten to know them all on the inside. And in every, I, I hate it when I see a, you know a government tender and it says, yeah, you have to have seven offices in minimum of five countries, and you have to be a multinational with revenues of a billion dollars to bid for this contract. Great. Do any of you, either of you, want to ans answer the question around alternative sources as well? Um, and if you have any experience with that, Mr. I, I want to actually reinforce Ahmed's message, and I, I think internally we do a lot of that to make sure that we, we actually find that SME type suppliers tend to be more nimble and responsive to your needs. So where, where, where we can, we tend to do that. But I think in terms of the overall alternative infrastructure for financing in this part of the world, it's, it, is, it is lacking for startups, I mean, compared with other places in the world. But generally speaking, if you look at early stage uh, businesses and early startups, it's always a challenge to find funding globally, more so in this region because the, just the framework and the ecosystem is still uh, evolving. And, and I think the, the th we all have to recognize that, and, and we were having a chat just before we walked into this panel, that you know, 98% of ventures will not get funding, 98%. Right. I mean, just if you stop and pause and think about that statistic, there's almost an expectation among entrepreneurs, almost a strong sense of entitlement that comes from their passion around their businesses, that they deserve that funding. And they probably do in a lot of these cases, certainly more than the 2% that end up with it. But there is a harsh reality around what the real uh, situation is. So the alternative is that you're gonna basically, you know, all chips in, 
and you're going to basically have to bootstrap the business, you know, tr traditional savings, friends, family, credit, everything else, I mean, personal credit, and then take the business to a level where you can convert some people into believing into your business and taking it to the next level. So if you're all in and you're able to take it to some point, your ability to, to work, whether even whether it's with the traditional sources such as banks or come to people like us, you know, there's a solution obviously in crowdfunding where, you know, it's a democratization of the funding process to a very large extent. That, that, those are interesting alternatives, but, right. but we have to also acknowledge the realities around this. No, that's a, that's a very good point. So actually just building on that, I would say that a lot of the companies, uh, 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 startups I've seen, or even uh, late stage companies in this region have been services companies, right? Which don't have traditional hard assets that you can point to, right? Like some you know, power plant or whatever. So for services companies with intangible assets, um, you know, do you even advise trying to go raise money? And, inf and if so, what are some of the impediments? Or do you do you encourage them to try and bootstrap and get to cash flow positive as, as, as soon as possible? I think what you see in this region is people try to work towards cash flow positive probably earlier than they would otherwise because of the lack of financing alternatives. So you'll find a lot of startups, and we've had our own experience, I was mentioning uh, Maktoub on an earlier panel, where you know there was always an eye, when we backed it, there was yeah, sorry. There was always an eye on maintaining positive cash flow and profitability, perhaps at the expense of growth, but that's unfortunately the trade-off uh, some of these businesses uh, need to do. We, we, we personally don't typically invest in the early stage space. We've done a lot of initiatives to help build the ecosystem because it does feed into us. So for example, we incubated a platform called Wanda that was that is you know, promoting entrepreneurship and also does early stage investing. This is something we incubated and run separately with its own management because they have the DNA to assess this. But uh, it's not an area we're very active in the early stage. We take it you know, probably past wh wh where the rest of my fellow panelists so, are. So, so Ahmed, on your side, do you consider um, services companies um, when you look at investments? And if so, what kind of services companies would you consider investing in? Or have you invested? We, we consider mostly uh, tech companies and quite a few of those are services. I would say that, uh, as you said, companies with hard assets typically have less difficulty finding financing because there's leasing companies, commercial banks, uh, financial institutions in the region are more comfortable leasing against collateral. Right. And it's the service companies that really have to come to us and come to the non-traditional uh, financing, at least for the region. And that's where we're looking for innovation and something different and we're betting, we're betting on the people, okay? And that's because it's not uh, invention driven is why we have the motivation and we really, we have to roll up our sleeves and be very involved to add value because we're not sitting on our hands waiting for somebody to invent the next rocket that's gonna make us you know, a thousand times our money, unlike maybe some other models in the US or in different uh, markets. So, Walt, I want to ask you this question, right? Because you said one of the things you guys really focus on is uh, is helping companies scale. So, um, do you work with any services companies, and, and in, in terms of helping scale, and if so, how does that translate? Because traditionally, the problem with services companies is that you need you know an extra body for every dollar of revenue, right? So, how do you help them scale? Yeah. So, the the short answer is um, we haven't figured out the math that overcomes that fundamental equation, right? And that's part of the reason why valuations typically for services companies are really modest. Typically what you're gonna look at is about a 1x revenue right. multiple, right? And then in terms of, of financing, because of the whole scaling issue, if they don't have a business model that's cash flow positive relatively quickly, it's a gigantic red flag. So as a general rule on, on the strict services side, they don't tend to be the, the companies that are going to get to that kind of 50, 100, 200 million that we'll be backing on a regular basis. I mean, I, I advise a cloud services company, and it's a great business. Margins are, are wonderful, 50% margin. The guy's growing really, really nicely, but it's still a really fundamental uh, math challenge around scaling. So now that said, again, keep it real, right? If you've got a good services business, go for it by all means. Right? If it's a value-added business, you can make a really, really nice living. You can give a lot of really good value-add jobs. You may never have to get in front of a, a, a VC who adds no value or who adds a lot of value. 
right? But building a business in, in the services space is, is, is critically important. So I, I don't want that to dissuade anyone from, from that as a business model. It's just not typically the one that's going to give the math that a VC, for example, is looking for. Right. Okay, so I've been told I have, I think, uh, 12 minutes or something left, so I want to make sure that uh, the audience has uh, uh, a chance to ask. So just when you're asking a question, just give your name and, and, and you know, maybe your company, and if the, if the a question is directed towards a particular person, then please mention that. If it's general, just mention that as well, all right? So um, who's going to take the first, uh, first question? Um, why don't we, yes, right here. My name is uh, Gamal Shahata. I'm from Egypt. Associate Professor at Cairo University. I actually have two points I'd like uh, to share them with you, and also I'd like to get an answer from Mr. Ahmed Alfi. The first point actually is about information. <coughs> actually, one important issue in the Middle East, we do not have information about all the small business initiatives. For example, uh, when you compare uh, an institution like uh, Small Business Administration in America, which is sponsored by the American governments, you can find these actually organizations actually doing very interesting work in educating people about how to run a business from A to Z. But in the Middle East, we didn't have any organization that can actually bring all, uh, for example, all uh, the resources needed for people to learn about uh, small business. So I'm talking about the information issue, which is very important. The second actually uh, issue or comment I'd like to make is about uh, we had a, yani, engaged in a study in 1995 about why, why small business failed in Egypt. Actually, see, people there, they get across outstanding ideas. They are creative. They also they got access to finance, governmental and non-governmental. But mostly they failed because you do not understand the market. So I'd like you to shift the direction a little bit to how we can assess problems that are actually existing in the Middle East and this problem will be, I will say, opportunities for people to start small business to solve them. Because we learned that entrepreneurs are problem seekers, they are not problem avoiders. So I like uh, your comment on this, please. So I'm sorry, I think your question was directed towards Ahmed or to, uh, overall? Uh, uh, if I can summarize the question, it is how do you um, help entrepreneurs in the region uh, how do you frame the problems for them so that they can then try and solve those problems? Is that your question? Okay, well, that's an interesting uh, take on it. Uh, if any of you guys have any ideas. So, so when you talked about the Small Business Administration in the United States, I mean, you had experience with the Small Business Administration. It's pretty positive, yeah. Yeah, pretty positive, right? So, but there, it, it, I think it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's a program. So you have a program for loan guarantee. You target a certain segment, you get the government behind it, right? Um, the last place I would look for for advice or information on entrepreneurship would be the government, <laughs> right? That would be like, you know, learning ping pong from a goldfish. It, it's just not, it doesn't work, okay? The, um, and, and I used to be in the government, so I, I know. Um, in terms of, the, the information that's out there, I mean, look, I'm new to this region. I'm two years kind of into this region. Um, and I'm actually very surprised by how much is out there, right? So if you look at all the different players, if you look at WAMDA, for example, right? If you do a little bit of hard work, I think you're going to find a lot of information, but I don't think that will solve the basic problem, which is in a lot of countries, like Egypt, for example, it's really hard because of corruption and bureaucracy, right? And you gotta, get, you gotta get at that. Now another example, all right? I'll describe a country for you where it's extraordinarily difficult to go bankrupt. It takes about 10 years to unwind from a bankruptcy. It's really, really hard to fire anyone. So who in their right mind would go out, start a business without a guarantee that it's going to succeed, hire 20 people, recognizing that if it fails, not not because they're a crook, right? It could be 10 years before they clear their name. And in the meantime, they got to continue paying people. Do you know what country I'm describing? It's France, all right? But it could be, and you could put your own name down, it could be Egypt. It could be a number of countries in this region, all right? So with a lot of respect for all of the good work that a lot of government agencies do, 
you could probably give them a short list of about four things and say, fix this. Make it easy to go bankrupt, not for crooks, but for honest entrepreneurs. Give them some access to capital if they've got a credible story, right? Make it reasonably easy to hire and fire people, and then get out of the way. No, that would be my recommendation. Great. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd be happy with just get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, okay, so it's <laughs> even more basic. I, I, I get out would of take the way. just get out of the way because every entrepreneur I know can deal with a two year bankruptcy, a 10 year bankruptcy. I don't really care because they don't care. They're going to go do the business anyway. Right. So, uh, as far as I'm concerned, just have the government step aside. And okay, next. I, I, go ahead. Um, next question, just because I know we, have, we are short on time. So, anyone who has the, the speaker, uh, the, the, yes, right there. You, 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 sir. We'll take one more question after this, and then okay. we'll have to wrap up the session. All right. Okay. I'm going to talk about the issue that was raised by you, Professor Imran. Uh, when you speak ab about uh, alternative uh, sources of funding, uh, I guess VC, private equity, crowdsource, uh, crowdfunding is all good. But I think in this part of the world, in the MENA region, we're missing one important source of funding, which is the angel funds, angel investors. What's the issue or what's the outlook for angel investors in our part of the world? Thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent, uh, excellent question. We've actually uh, tried to set up an angel fund in, uh, in Pakistan over the last uh, few years with uh, limited success. So I'd be interested to hear uh, you know, your experience with, uh, okay. with uh, no, I, better success I, in the MENA region. Sure. I think when you look at angel investors anywhere in the world, they're typically investors that have been successful in their own entrepreneurial ventures and know what it takes to be an entrepreneur and the challenges you face and believe in the model. So I think that it, it's slowly building up. There's numerous examples of people today in the region that are starting to be more active. When we created the WAMDA platform, it was again to bring angel investors. I think you know there's a network of people in their individual capacity, including the panelists here, that are uh, angel investors in their own right. You've seen successful stories. For example, uh, you look at whether it's Oasis 500 and they and how they help uh, funding. You look at uh, somebody like Fadil Ghandour, who has built a very successful business in the model of Aramex and has become an angel investor himself. You look at a startup like Maktoub, where the founders today, having been through the 12, 15 year journey that it takes to make a successful business and realize an exit, know what it takes for the next generation to go forward and are angel investors. You look at the founders of Bait.com, I'm looking at examples that we are even here in Dubai, like Rabia Atea or Danny Farha. All of these people are active as angel investors. So, uh, And there's one common thread amongst all of those, that they have worked hard, have been successful, the market has rewarded their success, and there's a, both a sense of give back and also a sense of, here's an opportunity I can, I can back and, and, and benefit from. So it, ta it takes time to get there. Yeah, it, it's, it's very much of a, of, a, of a chicken and egg situation. Right. Uh, and, and Mustafa's bang on right. So we, we took a look in our organization at the development of entrepreneurial ecosystems in places like um, Buenos Aires, in Amman, Istanbul, Santiago, Chile. And behind almost every one of them, we found three to seven successful entrepreneurs who wanted to give back through inspiration, through mentorship, through investment, through their employees starting companies. And it's really, it doesn't take much more than that. Now, there are angel networks out there, and Bill Morrow right here, you can raise your hand, Bill, is from uh, Angel's Den. And there's organizations that are trying to create angel networks, but I think fundamentally, you've got to get these, th this core of successful entrepreneurs who've done well, and they're the ones who are going to give not just the angel investment, but the mentorship. So, you know, if you had to summarize, hanging out with really smart, really rich former entrepreneurs is a good idea if you want to build your business, <laughs> right? That's very true. Great, thanks. Uh, okay, we go. We have uh, que uh, our one final, more. our final our question final of the question. day. We've been super generous to a lot of the delegates who are um, lucky to be seated up front. But let's not forget our attentive delegates in the back. So I'm just over here. Actually, um, can we get a question from one of the ladies? Because um, we've had a, an all all male audience here so far, uh, or all male panel. Um, so, any of the sorry, ladies are, there? Sorry, are you in a hurry? Is there a panel after this, or do you have somewhere to go? Well, I mean, these people want. Let if, I mean, I, we're not in a rush. If, if you're not in a rush, or do you need to turn off the lights or something? I suppose we could try and take a few more questions, Stuart.
Very entrepreneurial. All right, if we can get, I, I, I saw a, a hand by one of the ladies in the back, so um, if okay, someone we'll can take a question from one of the ladies, and then this kind gentleman who's been waiting for about 15 minutes, we'll get to him and a few more. All right. مساء الخير ممكن بس أحكي في العربي ممكن اسمي آية مليتات من فلسطين أعتبر سيدة أعمال ريادية بلشت فكرة مشروعي من البداية من دون ما أخذ تمويل الفكرة اللي بدي أحكيها إنه أنتم بتحكوا عن التمويل والاستثمار بلشت إنه أبلش مشروعي من من دون من دون ما أبحث عن المال بجهدي ومهاراتي وإن أطور من نفسي وصلت لمرحلة كتير كبيرة من 2010 تطورت وصار عندي مزرعتين كبار بجهدي الخاص أو أكد على فكرتكم في إنه الواحد حلو إنه يبلش هو بشغل ومهاراته لكن أنا بعتقد إنه لما أكون أنا إنتربنور وبلش ب بالرأس مال الخاص اللي من عندي وأنا بكون صغير في العمر وما عندي أصول ثابتة بحتاج لمرحلة من المراحل لأتطور بعد سنة وسنتين بيكون عنده الواحد خطة فبحتاج إنه أكيد لتمويل فهون بوصل لمرحلة إنه هو وين بده يروح إن أنا اشتغلت ووصلت لدرجة كتير حل كتير جيدة وإلها إقبالها في المجتمع وعرفت أنت مين بدك تسوق بس إمكانياتك المادية أصبحت عائق في هاي اللحظة وفي هذا الوقت كيف الواحد لازم يساوي شكرا I'll just translate this uh, for the benefit of those who don't speak. I was going to say that as a moderator here, yeah. I have zero value because it, 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 it really might help him as Mustafa, well. Mustafa, why, why don't you let question? me take this one, if, if I could? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so, so she's an entrepreneur from, from Palestine, and she's self-funded her business, and, and it's an agricultural business, and it's, you know, through all of her you know, personal resource commitment, hard work over a period of time, it's reached a scale. She's like, but to go forward needs further resources. In this part of the world, it's a big challenge to take it to the next stage. So, so what does one do? Fair enough. Well, who wants to uh, who wants to take a shot at this? Ahmed. Do you want to respond in English? ممكن أرد بالإنجليزي تفهميني. Okay. So uh, I think you have to do very similar things to what we talked about, but start with the closest circle and work your way out from the circle of acquaintances and people that you have. I don't know of a lot of the government or individual funds who will invest in agricultural businesses, but uh, okay. uh, I, I will. I'll, I'll answer in English for the audience. Okay. So, we'll we'll. Uh, very similar uh, approach to what we were talking about. You have to start with the closest circle of people that you know and expand the circle to potential investors and banks. But I don't think that there's any secret that I'm going to be able to tell you that you don't already know in looking at expanding your business. You've done what I think is the right thing, which is put yourself on the line and maintained the ownership yourself and put your equity and your pers your you know, your assets into what you've done so far. I mean, I, I just, I want to step in here for a sec. I mean, I know I'm a moderator, but one of the things I, I've seen in my experience in helping entrepreneurs who have successful businesses grow is helping them imagine the possibilities, right? Dream outside of their traditional box. We found that a lot of times entrepreneurs have been successful and c content, but they don't know what they don't know, right? They don't know the the realm of possibilities. And if you can help them dream, that helps give that extra fire that really takes them to the next level. We found that to be particularly effective in Pakistan when we've helped entrepreneurs grow their businesses. So that's just some uh, uh, one experience there. All right, um, I think there was a gentleman you said that was waiting for a while, so. Um. Hi, my name is Faisal Mubarak. Uh, I'm just asking, starting from the frozen yogurt theory, you know, to the black shoals theory. Sometimes we have a great idea, but we don't know how to fund it. And you say you don't show a lot of calculations, you know, in your uh, in your proposal or in, in your business study. So.
So I just want exactly what we require to show in quantitative or qualitative things that we require to show in a one page. Like if we are going to, with a great idea, what we need to show to the venture capital to gain the access to the capital. Like exactly, we don't want a lot of investment appraisal technique, but we want specific thing that you require and you are, it's taking your attention. Like exactly, we have a, a fro <laughs> it's not like a frozen yogurt theory. We have a lot of Im investment appraisal technique. Black shows or whatever, you know, we don't want to show you the IRR, but we have, we, we want to know exactly what you require to get the, the access to the, to the venture capital. Okay. I don't know if I'm the right one to be answering this, but um, we have an expression called proof is in the pudding. So you have to have your proof of concept done, and then you, like I was talking about before, I no, think no, what people exact, want. Like exactly what's taking your attention, you know, I want the core thing. It's not about the presentation. It's about what's exactly taking your attention aside with it. Okay, so I had started a company in the United States that was a three-time Inc. 500 company, a hyper-growth business, and I went out and I did three rounds of financing from private equity. And when I went in there, I asked them a similar question, and what they said is, show us proof that people will buy this. So it was me going out there, getting people to rally around the business idea, and then going back to them saying, here's the proof that you want it. Because at the end of the day, they knew they, they were investing in me and they were investing in the business model, but they really wanted to know if it was something more than just me itself, if other people were actually going to use this product or service. Okay, thank you. And I, I'll just make a comment. If uh, I think well, what he just said is exactly spot on for many businesses. For the businesses that I was talking about, and I think maybe you were asking about because of some of my comments earlier, they were more about technology businesses which are conceptual so if you're going to start a restaurant for XYZ for this underserved area you have to do a proof of concept you have to do a lot of what Woody has said but what I'm talking about is for technology companies and for somebody trying to do something new or transformational and those are the things where I don't look at IRRs but if I'm looking at buying a building or a real estate investment, of course I'm looking at IRRs. That's a different type of thing. That's not a startup funding. And uh, I don't invest in traditional businesses. I invest mostly and only in high tech. Okay, so the concept is the most important part for me. I should have been more specific in my earlier explanation. I apologize. Yeah, so I, I just want to add one more thing for Faisal here, which is right. Um, when you're, the most important thing as, as, as Ahmed said is to have a compelling idea, but also, do your due diligence, right? So if you're going to be pitching to Ahmed, don't have an IRR. But if you're pitching to someone else, they might want a little bit more financials, right? So learn to learn about the investor that you're going to pitch to. It's probably a good idea as well. So next question. Uh, yes, right there. Hi, my name is Doha. Um, uh, looking at um, inter entrepreneurship, it always involves finances and it always involves financials. So as business people, how would you address financial literacy among young people? We have a lot of financially illiterate young people within this region. Let's talk about the MENA region. And that's why we can see them more going more to be consumers rather than creators of their own services and their own applications and uh, their own finance and their own uh, projects. So for me to start with, we have to think about um, teaching them, youth, to be more aware about their finances and how to manage their finances. So how would you address this? Thank you. Well, uh, um, so I'll start with the fact that I'm not an educator. So, you know, I'm approaching this from, is that okay? Can I, can I still, I can still answer? Yeah? Um, so I think you start with math, right? So financial literacy is essentially, you, you have to have that basis. And when you talk about a skills gap, and I, and I don't mean to dismiss knowing more. There, um, th there are organizations like Imjaz, and um, Abraj has been very, very supportive of them, a number of other folks. That's kind of a junior achiever, where they're trying to get young people around this whole idea of understanding financial literacy, starting a businesses, what does that mean? But, but I mean, look, honestly, um, I think worldwide, there is this, there's a gigantic education gap that we have to address. And, and I mean, I'm in the United States and we've been talking ab about education reform for 40 years, 50 years, right? And, and it's always kind of that next, 
that next wave. And at the same time, uh, you know, I still feel like fundamentally, as a society, we haven't really truly owned up to it. And, and you know, I think one of the most basic societal obligations and what anyone should demand of their government is how are you educating your young people? Now, the other thing that's emerging is people are throwing up their hands and saying, look, governments are doing a poor job. We're going to come up with alternate models, right? I mean, you've got uh, charter schools and private schools that are emerging all over. But I think it goes way beyond financial literacy, quite honestly, right? Particularly in this part of the world where you've got a demographic opportunity, right? An extraordinarily young population. And that could be huge or it could be very, very challenging. So, Emma, do you, had, do you want to say something? Uh, we don't really care for the startups that we fund about financial literacy, so we work around it because I agree with you. Uh, we've funded 30 companies in the last two years, and very few of them had any financial. They were all pretty much financially illiterate, and some of them are here in the audience, and sorry to call you guys illiterate financially, but uh, you, know, you know who you are. Uh, but we bring in we bring in coaches and part of the program is we educate them and we take the responsibility of educating them and we have a we have the American University comes in Price Waterhouse comes in and we teach the CEOs and the mid-level staff of those startups how to handle their books how to do P&Ls we help them do budgets uh, you know Excel how to do all their projections so it can be taught Financial, financial literacy is a lot easier to teach than entrepreneurship in general or the spirit and desire. It's really hard to teach desire. Great. Uh, My name is Suleiman and I rep uh, represent the Saifi Group. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, I'm a little bit, uh, let's say I'm not shocked, but I'm a little bit disappointed because obviously each and every one of you are representing your own interests, right? But at the same time, we're here to educate people and people that are new in this field. Now, if one of you guys are talking about how VCs add no cap or no value, that's not true because obviously if you're someone who wants to really scale their business and have an exit strategy and you want to make money quickly and you get VC funding, more than likely that objective will be met. But if you're looking at something where it's more social, you're actually trying to help out, I think crowdsourcing is more in line. And I think overall, crowdsourcing isn't really the new thing, but I think it represents the paradigm shift that's basically occurring. I mean, no business plan, I don't care if it's from MIT or Harvard, it does not survive its first contact with the customer, right? So startups are all about searching, not executing like established companies. So the point that I'm trying to make is I guess every one of you has a different type of value that you offer to a different person, okay? With VCs, I would go with a VC friend of mine anytime to a casino because you guys are, that's exactly what you guys are doing, basically, in my opinion. Oh, sorry, um, do, do you, out, out of 20 companies, only one will hit it big and you'll make all your money, right? Whereas with other companies, it really depends. So I think we need to get the facts straight and not really make bold statements. And uh, I think that's a little bit misleading to people that are relatively new or... So you, did you have a question or you just had a comment? No, but I want to see if you guys do agree with me on that or if you guys want to refute that those statements. Well, I, I mean, uh, to their defense, I think what I was saying earlier is exactly that. Everyone along this spectrum plays a very important role and it differs depending on where you come in. So I can't provide the same type of value that, that a VC can, but a VC is not going to take you seriously until you've done the work that probably someone in my stage needs to do. So I don't know if we, maybe, I thought we were getting that across, but maybe I'll just repeat that. Um, but I, I do think everyone plays a very critical role at different stages. Oh, definitely, I agree. But I'm disappointed by the MIT professor because you're saying that VCs add no value. They add value. Uh, it depends what you're looking for. Though, sorry, right? can I, can I, can I, can I, uh, I, let me comment. Uh, so up, up here on the panel, the only thing we can do is share our experience sure. because I can't really regurgitate to you what's in a book because you can read the same book. But sharing my experience, if you can get some value out of that, that part is unique. And that's the unique part that we're all trying to add here. And so I think it's very appropriate that he's sharing his experience, sure. whether I disagree with it or not. I value his experience and I value that when he shares it, I learn from it. Oh, definitely. So, I'm not, I'm not uh, basically arguing against that fact. That, that's all. I'm saying that people add value. It doesn't matter who you are. 
you can add value to somebody else. And so I'm saying, and in, and in the comment, that adds value as well, in that his experience, he did not feel that there was value added from my peers to his experience. I appreciate and respect that. Yeah. Uh, any, also, let's, also, let's take let, a last. Uh, let's take a last. Im question. Imran, could I just uh, just one other one other quick point? Um, how many companies did you say you started? Three. Um, I've started three. I've been involved with probably about twenty, just from my. Okay, as so an start. So I mean, just just throw the man a bone, right? He's a professor at MIT, and he started three companies, and he's talking about entrepreneurship. So I'd kind of just say, look, if you had a bad experience with VC, point taken. I'll make sure I'm, you know, going into it eyes wide open. Hi, uh, yes. my name is Khaled from Kuwait. Uh, I have a question with regards to growing companies from this region, access to markets outside. So, uh, a lot of us, after a certain point in time, our businesses will grow, or do have reached that level where they identify a, an opportunity in a foreign market. So, Europe, America, wherever maybe. Is it better at that point to seek uh, funding from there for that market opportunity, or would it work best for us to go through our networks here and fund a project abroad? Um, it's a challenge that I'm running into right now, and um, the the two pictures that I have is I can probably find money in the region quicker through the network, but the opportunity is not here. So right. it's kind of a dilemma for many companies that want to grow beyond a regional operation. That's a great question. Actually, something that a lot of companies we look at as well through our MIT network as well as uh, my organization of Pakistani entrepreneurs face the same question, right? Raise money where you know it or raise money where the opportunity is. So I'd love to get the panel's perspective on, uh, sure. on that. I'm sure there's no one answer, but we'd there love is to get your There is no one answer, but I'll, I'll share a few experiences. I mean, uh, a lot of the themes around how we invest is around taking businesses that are successful local champions and making them regional champions and off and beyond. And I think, so we found that over time, the best way to gear ourselves is to be present into the markets where people want to be. So we're present across all emerging markets. And let's say you're a MENA based business. Your first expansion typically will be through contiguous geographies, geographies that are close to you, geographies within the sphere of influence of what you do. That's usually the easiest expansion. If I'm, uh, uh, so, so let's say you're a Jordan-based company or an Egypt-based company or a UAE-based company. You'll expand to the GCC, into the Levant, into parts of North Africa. Uh, that's a natural. So I think between you knowing where your product works and having a supportive investor that actually has access to these markets or at least can support, th there's different levels of support. We could, you could be a sounding board to your strategies and help you think out those strategies. There's a different level of support where we could have, and in our, our case we do, we'd have a relevant office network and reach into these geographies. So you're effectively su supporting the, we're supporting your business development to a certain extent. So think of us as a M&A and business development arm that takes you sort of to, to the next level. So when you look for capital, is and, and, and I go back to the point, it's not just, you know, uh, if you're a growth business, you're not just looking for the capital, you're looking for supportive capital. You're gonna have to look what suits your business. So I, I may be the right partner for another business and I may be the wrong partner for, for, for another. But I think uh, if it's regional markets and emerging markets where a lot of growth is, is happening, you want to be invest, uh, your partner to be someone who has access to those markets. That's ultimately gonna work better for you. Great, thank you. Um, so I think with that, we're going to end uh, end this uh, panel. It's been uh, sorry. Can I, I just I, I can't leave him with this young man with this advice. Okay, fair enough. Okay, <laughs> son. Fair enough. You're playing poker with your life. All right. You take the money, or are you doubling down and betting you're going to get it outside? Okay. You, don't, just, how big a gambler are you? If I am your age and I'm starting a company, I take the money immediately. Okay, from the first person who gives it to me. All right, unless you're like, because if you're going to have a home run company and somebody's going to give you a slightly lower valuation, you're going to make eight million versus ten million. That's what you're going to negotiate on now and risk your company and wait maybe not to get around to funding, or you're going to make thirty percent less in ten years. Who cares? But, but, right? But but Ahmed, doesn't this go against the whole venture, the, the money being smart money and adding value? That's Sorry. That, that, <laughs> no, 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 I I agree with. Hey, and if. If, if he's willing to bet that he's going to be one of those 2% versus the 98 who don't get funded, right. right? And he's going to keep walking down the road and know that only 2% of the people that walk this path get funded, then 
He should keep walking down that path. But if you walk out of a room where somebody's willing to give you money today, you've gone back to the 98% pool, not the 2% pool. Now, so I, now I feel even stronger about this. You never <laughs> want to be with the wrong partner. Imagine choosing the wrong life partner. Your business is going to be your life for the next five years, seven years, and so is your partner. So with all due respect, I think so, it is so, extremely... So you started a look, I mean, the, no, look, we were friends and we sat no, here because no, of Ahmed you. Ahmed is a good friend. Ahmed, let, Ahmed let me good jump good. in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so Ahmed is a good friend here. I think it's somewhere in the middle. We're exaggerating. It's a bit of a character just to make sure we drive the point. At the end of the day, don't let your business go down the drain. If you need funding, you need funding. But it has to be somebody who's aligned with what you want to do. You don't want to be sitting in a boardroom fighting with a partner who just doesn't get what you're doing or is not supportive of what you're doing. So somewhere between the two, you need an aligned partner that actually can get you past where you are. Take you to but the next that partner is better than no partner, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, son, you're going to be single the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it's so with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you for a great panel. And uh, uh, thank you to all the panelists, to Emma, to uh, Walt, to Mustafa, to Sherwood. And uh, the, our point here was to have a lively discussion. Keep it real. If you offended anyone, I'm sorry. Uh, we're all available to answer questions afterwards if you have any. Thank you for attending.